This is Twit. And I gotta say, Micah, I'm psyched about your top story. This is super cool stuff. <laughs> like yes, amazing. Uh, absolutely. I mean, look, we've got, you know, all these new phones being announced and they have foldable screens in some cases. Uh, the latest iPhones have better cameras and processors. And that's fine. But let's talk about the smallest ever human made flying structure. Um, this is such a cool story, and we are joined today by Professor John Rogers of the Robert R. McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at, North at Northwestern. Woo, I tried to say that all in one breath. Welcome to the show, Professor John. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, guys. Hi. Yes, I know you are uh, very busy as this uh, piece is getting out there, and you probably have call after call. So we will get started here, uh, kicking things off. First, can you go ahead and talk about uh, just this this winged microchip on its own, kind of what this is, what uh, what has been created by you incredible folks uh, at, at Northwestern uh, at all, yeah. please? Yeah, sure. So just as a quick background, I'm on the faculty here, and so I I run a fairly large interdisciplinary um, research group. Most of what we do is kind of at the boundaries between engineering and medicine. And so we've been interested in very tiny wireless devices that can integrate with the skin or implant into the body to monitor brain activity, physiological processes, that kind of thing. And uh, we've, we've for a while now sort of appreciated the uh, potential for those same type of technology platforms to be used for environmental monitoring monitoring the uh, atmosphere or properties of the groundwater, monitoring, you know, chemical spills during remediation er efforts and so on. Um, but the challenge there is in dispersal. Um, you know, for the human body, you can, you know, laminate a device onto the skin or you inject it, you know, into the depth of the body. But for large scale, meaningful uh, monitoring of the environment, you'd like to be able to take those devices and disperse them over wide areas or configure them so that they would remain aloft in the environment, in the atmosphere, for example, to monitor particulate pollution or airborne pathogens, that kind of thing. And so that was kind of the context uh, for for the project that that we've um, you know been able to pursue, and and what we'll talk about today is um, you know how do you add flight to uh, very small scale uh, pieces of electronics, sensors, radios, power supply systems, and so on. And so so that that was the context and and what we were hoping to achieve with this with this research. Yeah, and that's I think one of the the most amazing things there is that um, you have figured out how to to sort of mimic nature, or um, as as the Northwestern article quotes, we think that we beat nature, um, sort of taking this and iterating on it. One of the things I was kind of struck by was how small this technology is, because uh, can, can, I mean, if you could first kind of talk about the inspiration of those uh, back where I'm from in the Midwest, uh, those nice little whirly gigs that uh, fall from the from the yeah. sky as those seeds get yeah. planted but i i didn't realize that this technology could sort of be on a miniature scale too and still be able to uh, have that same aerodynamic effect so can you talk about your inspiration here and then maybe a little bit about the physics of this much smaller uh design yeah, yeah, that, that's a very important point. I mean, what we wanted to do is create, um, you know, flight in structures that could be scaled to very small dimensions because um, that that's kind of uh, re represents the overall dominating trend in the development of electronics technologies, really size miniaturization. As you make things smaller, um, you know, you can reduce the cost, for example. Um, in this context, you know, we envision in the future, you know, deploying thousands of these devices over large areas and they could, you know, form a wireless network and so on. And so making them small is important in order uh, to make this whole concept kind of economically viable. Um, but but the inspiration, you know, it do, does der derive from biology. I mean, we were thinking about, you know, how would you, um, you know, aerially disperse these uh, devices? And, and the first thing you might think about is, um, you know, how would you create flapping wings, you know, so that the microchips could fly away like a mosquito or a gnat or something like that. And uh, I think maybe that's a longer term aspiration. You can imagine that's very um, difficult from from a technical standpoint. But but other, you know, organisms in the biological world do do things through passive flight, um, which can also be re really um, valuable. In particular, plants and trees, as you mentioned, you know, maple uh, seeds have uh, a, a winged type of geometry that induces a rotational flight dynamics that um, reduces the falling speed 
and increases thereby the uh, time duration with which the seeds can interact with ambient patterns of uh, airflow, uh, wind, mm. uh, to increase the distance for um, you know dispersal from from the source from from the tree itself. And you think about cottonwood trees or dandelions. There are all kinds of different uh, sort of flight dynamics uh, principles that have been incorporated directly into these wind dispersed seeds, driven by evolutionary forces, right? And so we figured, well, maybe we could adapt and extend and modify those kinds of ideas to um, you know, disperse our very tiny electronic uh, sensor technologies. And so that's what we've done. Uh, a lot of the paper is looking at the fundamental physics of the aerodynamics of these kinds of structures, but not at the size scale of seeds. Ma maple seeds are pretty big, maybe a couple of inches long, but but at much smaller dimensions to take advantage of the um, you know size reductions and miniaturization efforts that are happening in consumer electronics gadgetry and um, you know integrated circuit chips. And so so there are principles in aerodynamics that scale nicely down as you reduce dimensions, uh, but at some point if you make these structures too small, uh, then that flight dynamics kind of uh, disappears and everything behaves like a like a sphere, essentially. So we we push the sizes down to the millimeter scale where we can still capture that helicopter rotational flight dynamics, uh, but but at size dimensions and, and, and um, you know, with features that are that are much smaller than you would see in seeds. Mm -hmm. And so the one of the things that I was reading in this uh, in, in the article of the uh, talking about the study was that where you've got sort of seed dispersal uh, as a factor of, of making sure that these trees can sort of go out and, and be in a lot of places here. Part of the goal is to keep these in the air for longer so that you can track things like air pollution. What are um, what are some of the sort of. Uh, what are some of the uses of this technology uh, that maybe, you know, are different from just sort of dispersing something onto the ground in a, in a location? Yeah, yeah, good good question. I mean, there's sort of two envisioned modes of use, one uh, in which the devices are doing the sensing after they land on the ground. So monitoring, um, you know, heavy metal contamination in ground, groundwater, for example, we have, um, you know, strategies for doing that, measuring cadmium, mercury, lead, those kinds of species, um, you know, in, in the groundwater, other things as well, pH and so on. The, the other set of uh, applications sort of refer to, to your point, which is, um, you know, measuring um, airborne um, species, um, chemicals, uh, biological pathogens, particulate pollution and so on. And if that's your goal, you really uh, are interested in designing flying structures that remain aloft, you know, in the air um, as long as possible. So seeds, I think, are doing that for purposes of lateral dispersal, sort of uh, maximizing the distance over which they travel before they land on the ground. Our motivation is a little bit different. It's like keep these things in the air so that they can engage with these airborne, you know, sensing targets. Um, for for as long as possible, and so so those those are the two two aspects. In some ways, they're they're synergistic. There's some sort of common elements in in how you do the aerodynamic design, but the but the the ways that that you're doing the sensing and and the um, and the goals are a little bit different. So uh, you know the, the new uh, iPhone just uh, was announced. It's coming out tomorrow, and one of the things that Apple showed off on stage was that they've sort of miniaturized some of the uh, internal components to make the battery bigger, so that it has all day battery life. I look at this thing; it's already as small as a carpenter ant's head, and the technology packed into it is even smaller than that. How does this thing have any power at all? What, what are we working yeah. with here to make this thing work? Yeah, power supply is is a, is a real challenge, uh, obviously. So, so there are a couple of different, you know, fully formed devices that we reported in this paper. Uh, and just to take a step back, this is the first time these concepts have been introduced, and so we're at the ver very early stages of developing, you know, a suite of capabilities, uh, you know, uh, in, in this class of technology. But, but we demonstrated two things. One uh, is a class of device that doesn't require any power at all. It's not electronic. It's providing a sensing function based on a color change. Um, associated with a particular chemical reagent that responds through a color change to a species of interest in the environment. And so we demonstrated pH and, um, and heavy metal uh, sensing using those, those kind of color change uh, principles. 
And in that uh, in that type of device, you do wireless readout with high resolution digital imagery. Uh, they can be captured with a drone, for example. So, so that that's one way to just sidestep the um, issue of um, power supply completely. Um, all the wireless uh, capability and the power is uh, embodied in the reader unit, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, high resolution digital camera. The other um, you know platform that we demonstrated is fully electronic and digital in its operation. And uh, we built it to uh, operate based on uh, a combination of power sources. One is solar. So it's powered by sunlight uh, that's striking the device. And, and the other, uh, which supports wireless data communication, is that uh, we harvest wirelessly um, transmitted power from uh, an external reader unit. So it's oh. similar to the kind of NFC wireless payment schemes that are built into phones these days, but capable of operating over a, a much longer distance. Excellent. All right. One final question for you that is addressed in uh, in, in the article. I think uh, people look and they see, oh, look at that little ladybug and there's this tiny little microchip next to it and a carpenter ant. And then they start to go, oh, but there's a little microchip laying on the ground next to a ladybug and a carpenter ant. Let's talk about e-waste. Uh, yeah. What are some of the implications here and what has uh, your team sort of considered in, uh, in, in this dispersal unit and uh, all of the, yeah. the uh, involved <laughs> issues. Yeah, yeah, super important is, uh, issue and and, and a, a consideration that that has to be, you know, prioritized in the development of any kind of technology like this. And I would say that if we didn't think we had an answer to that question, we probably wouldn't have even worked in this direction because I think right. the potential for you know massive you know adverse effects associated with electronic waste in in this kind of um, uh, platform would be would be significant so so there we were able to uh, tap into a set of electronic materials that we've developed for temporary implants so they're sort of like resorbable sutures in a sense that they dissolve away when exposed to biofluids slowly over time but they have the capability for uh, supporting all kinds of electronic functionality you know wireless communication wireless power harvesting digital sensing and so on and we can exploit those same collections of materials and fabrication techniques and device designs in these um, you know um, environmentally um, you know distributed uh, sensors and so so we've dem demonstrated that, that that as well devices that just degrade into the environment to uh, benign end products. So they just naturally disappear and you can engineer them to um, you know, satisfy particular operating lifetime requirements. So maybe they operate for a couple of months and then they completely degrade and disappear uh, harmlessly into the environment over the subsequent several months. Uh, so so this, is, this is very much a viable uh, solution and an answer to that uh, very important question about electronic waste. Awesome. Well, Professor John Rogers, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to us. I wish you the best and uh, the remaining calls you have as you have uh, you know, <laughs> reached a feat of, of uh, human uh, mechanical and, and uh, biological understanding. It's incredible. Um, of course, folks can head over to the link we'll include in the show notes to learn more about this. And uh, this uh, study also got the uh, cover on uh, September 23rd's issue of Nature, which is awesome. Um, where should folks go if they want to continue to follow your work? Uh, they can go to my uh, research group website. It's hosted uh, at northwestern.edu. Uh, so uh, if you just Google it, it, it'll come right up. Awesome. Thanks so much. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you.